to today's webinar with Mai Saya from, pharma, from the Pharmacokinetic and Drug Metabolism Group at Amgen in San Francisco. And she'll tell us everything about the quantification of oligonucleotide therapeutics in serum and tissue. Thank you very much for volunteering to do this. My, um, over to you. Um, hi. 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 A little bit of background to that fix it up. Petra, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so, hello, and thank you for having me today for this webinar. Um, today, we're going to talk about how ADME makes sense uh, quantification methods of oligonucleotides in serum and in. Um, first, I'd like to start off with acknowledging my colleagues at Amgen who've contributed to the work showcased in this slide deck. Um, I have colleagues from Pharmacokinetics and Drug Metabolism, um, Molecular Engineering, and Hybrid Modality Departments shown in the slide deck. And putting forward my disclosure that I'm an employee and stockholder of Amgen. To start out, here is a presentation outline of the topics that we will cover today. First, we'll address the need for a bioanalytical toolkit in this field, and then we'll go into the quantification methods discussed. We have in vitro and in vivo imaging with immunofluorescence and immunohistochemistry, fire distribution with the radio labeled material, and metabolite identification with mass spec, some plate based hybridization assays, and we'll end with plasma protein binding, and closing thoughts. So the slides will go from assay to assay, and I think it'd be better if we had questions at the end, um, and then we can go back and revisit each assay. And um, for perspective, while these techniques can be applied to both antisense oligonucleotides and siRNA, today I'm mainly focusing on our efforts towards siRNA quantification. And more importantly, I'll do my best to highlight um, caveats that we have experienced in these bioanalytics. So I'd like to speak towards the analytical methods that are currently used in the field and published in the literature and go through their advantages and their disadvantages. Um, we see a lot of PCR, and while PCR is highly sensitive, they require a primer probe design per analyte and um, a lot of next-gen modifications on our oligonucleotides um, can negatively impact primer probe efficiency with amplification. Uh, furthermore, PCR requires sample extraction and amplification, which is a pretty tedious Next on the list, we have hybridization methods, and this is either ELISA or LC. And hybridization methods are very common. They have great sequence specificity and very good sensitivity. Another disadvantage that's shared with PCR is that these require sequence-specific probes, and there are no pan-specific reagents that you can um, use if you're looking at like a variety of different sequences at once. Lastly, we have LCMS. Um, and this um, allows us for direct quantification with high sequence structure and um, specificity and metabolite identification. However, if we're working in biological matrices, we suffer poor from poor sensitivity. Um, the figure to the right here um, compares the sensitivity versus length of oligonucleotide sequence, um, showing the inverse sensitivity relationship between LC and hybridization. And the main take home from this slide is that there isn't one assay which captures everything that we need for quantifying oligonucleotides. And most of the time, we need multiple means to translate preclinical results to the clinic. So most of us who have newly joined the field or have been in the field for a while come from backgrounds of large or small molecules, and we're unsure exactly where oligonucleotides fit in the pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic space. Um, oligonucleotides are commonly administered subcutaneously, 
and are eliminated via catabolism or renal and biliary pathways. Where oligos differ from small and large molecules is their role in the blood compartment, how that varies plasma concentration. Um, small molecule plasma concentrations are directly related to pharmacodynamics, and large molecules can be either indirectly or directly. Um, if you're having um, TMDD or target mediated disposition, that would be an indirect relationship. Um, oligonucleotides in the plasma concentration, however, are completely removed from time and space in relation to pharmacodynamics. Because of this, we observe significant disconnects between plasma, tissue, and subcellular kinetics and the efficacy for SRNA therapy. So this slide is meant to set the scene for larger problems that we have from oligonucleotide therapeutics and SRNA and ASOs as they are very different from classic small and large molecules. As the modality matures, we are presented with an opportunity to dig deeper into the bio biophysical properties of oligonucleotides and how they impact biodistribution and delivery. Furthermore, unlike small and large molecules, therapies which typically display pharmacological effect via target engagement, oligonucleotides work via a catalytic mechanism, which really complicates the PKPD relationship. And here I have an example of that disconnect. So here we see um, on the left we have antisense serum exposures of an, so this is the antisense strand of a Galmac siRNA. Um, so the left we have concentration in nanogram per mil, and on the right we have target protein knockdown expressed as percent of protein remaining. And in this particular study, we're using non-human primates. We dose them a single dose, two mg per kg, subcutaneous. And we can see if we look at the serum exposure, um, the drug rapidly moves itself from the serum compartment around, we're showing here, eight hours that we collected. However, looking at the blood compartment, we're not able to see, we see PD way out past two months. So if we look at these two graphs and we look at the AUCs, we're not able to predict from the AUCs the duration of effect. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is that I have seen in the literature that it's convention to only measure or report the antisense strand of SRNA drugs. Although um, we understand that the antisense strand is the active form of the drug, measuring just a single strand does not really impart any information on duplex stability or even if the sense strand has a role to play in the um, exposure relationship. So with this, we'll go into the assays we've implemented here at Amgen to better understand these therapeutics. So the first technique we'll go into is immunofluorescence and immunohistochemistry detection approaches. So for this assay, these assays, we outsourced a reagent, and it's the um, anti-sRNA polyclonal antibody through Lampire Biological Labs. Um, where they conjugated a KLH peptide to the Galmac siRNA to enhance molecule half-life. Um, and in characterizing this polyclonal, we found that it was selective towards the fluorine modifications along our siRNA molecule. Um, we utilized this reagent in two ways, in immunofluorescence and immunohistochemistry. On the left-hand side of the, um, the screen, we are directly conjugating the polyclonal with two different Alexa labels. We have Alexa 488 and Alexa 467, um, which allowed us to visualize sRNA uptake with the flexibility of multiplexing with different um, cellular compartment markers. So you can see here on this side that we have our negative controls and we're seeing pretty clean um, signal, nothing from the polyclonal reacting with the cells. Um, and these are just hepatic cells. And on the right-hand side, um, we're seeing a dose-dependent signal with dose-dependent uh, titration of our drug, and pretty clean here. 
Um, on the right-hand side is the same reagent used, um, but however, a secondary antibody was used for detection. And so the upper panes um, right here are a wild-type mouse dosed with Dalmec siRNA, and the lower pane here are an ASGR1 knockout. And so we know that ASGR1 is responsible for the uptake of Dalmac. When we remove it, we don't see signal accumulating in the liver. Instead, it's going to the proximal tubes of the kidney and vice versa with wild-type mouse, where we see most of the sRNA signal um, with a DAD substrate inside the hepatic. Another tool utilized at Amgen is um, biodistribution with a radio-labeled siRNA. And what's really nice about biodistribution studies is that they're fundamental to identifying target organs and anticipating safety and efficacy from where the drug accumulates. Um, this work is done with an external, external collaboration with UMass's Department of Radiology to I-125 incorporate the antisense strand prior to its duplex hybridization with a sense strand, including the Galnac conjugate on it. We dosed this labeled Galnac siRNA to mice and collected the samples uh, 48 hours post-dose. We uh, accounted for the largest um, fraction in order from urine, carcass, injection site, feces, liver, and then kidney. So we can kind of see where this drug is being is eliminated and where it's accumulated as well. Um, now to talk about the caveats of this. Um, aside from the cost of these studies, incorporation of radio label is highly molecule dependent. Um, there is no indication of heterogeneity that you can get from your radio labeled material. This makes interpretation of the results difficult, um, but you do the best you can. Uh, for this study in particular, we cannot say much about the identity of where we see radiolabeled um, signals. So it could be your full parent analyte or it could be metabolites of your parent. Um, and, um, and you can see, like, you cannot tell what each metabolite is in the section of your pie. Um, but we generally know where the radiolabeled molecule is. Next, we have biotransformation of sRNA by LC High Res Mass Spec. And so this requires sample extraction and cleanup, which we perform with wax or weak anion exchange um, solid phase extraction. And so this involves uh, multiple wash steps to remove sugars, salts, lipids, and proteins from your biological matrices. Um, we then do iron pairing through reverse phase liquid chromatography before shooting, before shooting it on the high res map. So with this technique, we can gain important data about novel metabolites generated from both in vivo and in vitro sample. And um, while the extraction is tedious, um, there are no sequence specific probes needed. So we can easily um, look at multiple sequences at once. Um, to go further into some results um, from this mass spec um, LC, um, LCMS, um, what we did is we had an in vivo, in vitro system, and so we compared um, rat, non-human primate, and human liver homogenates, and we incubated our siRNA in the homogenates for 48 hours at 37C. And then we went ahead, did an extraction, and looked at the metabolites that were formed. So on the top pane, this one here, we're looking at um, in vitro antisense metabolites. And on the lower one, we're looking at Galnac metabolites on our sense strand. So we can kind of see that across the board for the in vitro samples, they're pretty much similar. There's no species difference for antisense metabolites. And for the Galmac metabolites, we definitely do see a species difference. So the rat is a lot different um, than non-human primate and human data here.
And so we're seeing if this recapitulated um, in vitro, I'm oh, sorry, in vivo. So on the top, I know these slides are a little bit busy. On the top, we have our antisense strand metabolites. So on the far left, we have our intact parent. And then we go across and we see N minus 1, 2, 3 from the 3 prime end, and then so on from the 5 prime end. And we can see as we go from rat in vivo samples to non-human primate in vivo samples that they're pretty much the same. We're seeing most parent and then N minus 1 metabolites. However, when we look at, um, and this correlates well with our in vitro samples. However, when we look at the correlation from in vitro to in vivo samples, we don't see a good connect here. So we're seeing that there's kind of a delay in kinetics where we're seeing mostly intact when we look in vitro. And when we move to in vivo, we see much more clipping of the sugars off of the tri um, anary gal mask. So from this set of data, um, we don't really look at Galmax stability using this um, screen. Um, we usually use um, rat livers to predict what molecules will look like in um, vivo. Um, okay, next, switching methods, we have a um, series of plate-based hybridization assays. So the first is a hybridization ligation immunoassay, which uses two complementary probes. Um, the capture probe is in green. Um, and so the capture probe is an LNA-modified um, DNA probe with an overhang, ten, nine base pair overhang. Um, which is complementary to a detection probe in pink. And so the pink probe is a pan-specific assay, so you can use it with any uh, sequence, but the complementary probe is directly complementary to your analyte of interest. When we have the detection probe um, and the sequence together, um, we are able to ligate the two, and so we add um, T4 ligase, and what happens here is the 3 prime OH and the 5 prime phosphate ligate together, creating a stable duplex um, with your anti uh, sorry, your digoxygenin um, tag. Um, when you do not have anything here, in a subsequent step, we add S4, or sorry, S1 nuclease, and the S1 nuclease recognizes the 3 prime, 5 prime phosphate and cleaves background signal. So here, when you can see, when you have your complete set, you are able to detect with an anti-digoxygenin um, antibody that's for um, sulfotagged or phenylated. And when you don't have any of the pairs, it's digested away and you have no signal. So to summarize, this is a plate-based two-step hybridization assay with an enzymatic ligation step and a nuclease digestion step. And we also do this on an electrochemiluminescent ECL platform for readout. And this basically um, lowers the background um, drastically when we compare this to um, uh, enzyme um, substrates such as adifos. Um, we find that this assay to be our gold standard in quantifying sRNA from biological matrices, as we can do all of this in a 96 volt plate uh, without any sample extraction. And the sensitivity for this assay we find to be in the peak molar range. Caveats of this assay is that you do have to design sequence specific probes for this assay, and you have to pay mind to steric hindrance as you orient the strands of interest. If you have a large ligand on the five prime end of your strand, it's going to have some steric hindrance with the plate. So pay mind to flip or orient um, your sequence probes um, to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, additionally, this, as this assay requires enzymatic steps, we find it to be sensitive to time and sensitive to temperature in the lab. So a lot of um, qualification needs to be done before you have a good assay, good robust assay. And to show the hybridization ligation ELISA's performance, we have this study. Um, it's a dose ranging study in non human primates following a single subcutaneous dose of 0.1, 1, and 10 mg per keg 
On the left, we have the serum exposures for all three doses with anti-sense strands as dashes and sense strands as solid lines. Um, we observe rapid clearance, um, typical of a galvanic sRNA over 24 hours. But interestingly, we see a resurgence of signal from the anti-sense strand alone. Um, and we believe we see this because the assay is very sensitive and we're currently investigating what this phenomenon is. We've coined it as recirculation, um, but we're still investigating the mechanisms of why this is happening. As for tissue exposures, these were taken with the 10 mg per kg dose on day 15 after dose, post dose. And we both show the sense and anti sense strand at very similar levels in the liver but at a disconnect in the kidney. So in the kidney, we're seeing a higher accumulation of sense strand um, compared to anti-sense strand. And um, to show the sensitivity of how this assay, how low it can go, we also did an AGO2 pull down of the livers, and we quantified using this assay, sense strand, anti-sense, and near 122, um, showing that all three are at equal concentrations with an AGO pull down. Our second plate-based assay is what we call the trihex forming oligonucleotide assay or TFO assay. Um, switching gears a little bit, we're still quantifying sRNA in this assay. However, um, it is conjugated to an antibody. So in this case, we're looking at an antibody with two sRNA conjugated to it. Um, so the figure to the left here, we have the antibody sRNA conjugate right here, immobilized by, um, if you can see there's a green line, a um, biotinylated DNA probe that is heavily modified. And it is so heavily modified that it's able to wind within the duplex of the sRNA, forming this triplex. Once immobilized, um, um, we follow with the detection with a refinylated um, uh, or sulfotag anti-human IgG. And so we, we say that this assay measures intact drug um, or uh, antibody conjugated drug. If you follow in with your samples and you run an FC-FC sandwich, you can also find just total antibody. So that doesn't matter um, if it has sRNA on it or not. And with this data, we're able to kind of see the kinetics of the pieces of your sRNA antibody conjugate. So here we have the solid lines and the solid, and these are just different antibody conjugate dose um, subcutaneously, or no, that's IV, sorry. Um, and then what we are seeing is that there's a divergence where we see intact drugs separate from total antibodies. So we can kind of get the kinetics on the stability in the blood compartment we're seeing if this divergence is um, target mediated. Um, I don't have the data on this slide, but you can also combine the hybridization ligation, hybridization ligation ELISA to see free drug as well. And I just don't have that data displayed here. Um, there are caveats with this assay. So efficient triplex formation may require purine or pyrimidine rich sequences. So the strand that you want to go for, it could switch via antisense or sense, depending on um, that sequence, um, purine and pyrimidine richness. Um, last of our assays, which we have kind of standalone, is our plasma protein binding assay. So to frame why we are doing this, um, there is regulatory um, guidance for small molecules that plasma protein binding is recommended for regulatory filing submissions as we kind of view um, sRNA as a small molecule. Uh, plasma protein is also super important aside from this in terms of total binding and identities of binding partners. Um, and currently, plasma protein binding in relation to all of the therapeutics is still an open question. Like, what role does it play? So for us, we basically applied um, the top three classic approaches for plasma protein binding, which are equilibrium dialysis, ultrafiltration, and ultracentrifugation. Um, and we use commercially available kits. 
um, in our hands, we found that ultrafiltration showed the best recoveries. And one important takeaway um, that we found with ultrafiltration is that although siRNA has a very small molecular weight, and I have it here in relation to other proteins here, um, you have to think about the biophysical properties of siRNA. Um, although it has a, it's, it occupies a small space, it's still a rigid rod. Um, and so when you are using ultrafiltration, you have to take into consider the molecular weight cutoff of your filter. And so here, yes, a molecular weight cutoff of 30 would have worked, but because it is a rod going through your filter, we actually found better recoveries using um, a filter molecular weight cutoff of 50 kilodaltons. Um, So in summary, um, biophysical aspects of oligonucleotides play an important role in their biodistribution and biotransformation. And we definitely need diverse bioanalytical assays and systems to understand this novel modality. And our picture of the ADNI or absorption distribution and metabolism elimination and pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic relationship is still emerging um, from this molecule. So I like to end with this and just show that we still have like this black box of unknowns with these therapeutic oligonucleotides. And so we definitely should dive deeper into these, um, these topics to see um, what information we can glean because anything we find plays roles into um, molecule safety and efficacy. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. So um, <clears throat> if anyone has questions, please type them in the chat box and I'll read them to May so she can answer them. Yeah, I can see some people are typing. people typing. Yes, thank you very much for, for doing such an informative uh, um, webinar. My pleasure. Um, particularly adding those little things that really, you know, people like the size molecular weight disconnect of this sRNA. I was not aware of that at all. So that's like, you know, just a little thing, but that can really, really make it difficult to get it right. So that's very helpful. Um, So we're still waiting. Um, <clears throat> three, four people typing. Yeah, and as ever, you know, volunteering to do this is uh, very much appreciated. Uh, we've got our first question from Simone who actually did a webinar for us last year on microRNA um, about the hybridization ligation immunoassay. How much time does the assay need from sample prep uh, to final detection? Hands-on time, what do you think? Oh yeah, so for us we find that most of this, the sample prep is definitely the longest part. So the assay itself takes about three and a half hours, so it's like a typical amino assay. You do, the enzymatic steps are relatively short, but you still have to coat your plate, or sorry, have your analyte on your plate and shake for an hour and then come in with the antibody um, and that's like an hour. So really hands-on time is an hour and a half. Um, the most tedious part is the grinding of the tissues. So we do have to grind, homogenize them pretty well in a lysis buffer. And usually in a study, like the tissue prep is what takes the longest time. So we usually have tissue prep on one day and then assay on another day. Um, how do you store the samples in between? 
from one day to um, the samples we just store in the minus 80. Mm -hmm. They're pretty good um, stability. And I can see she's also asking about the secondary metabolites or, um, yeah. So we definitely assessed um, the sensitivity of the assay to metabolites. And so we see um, signal with the assay for N minus one and N minus two um, from the assay. Um, for N minus three, we don't really see, we see about 25% signal. Um, so then when we look in vivo, we confirm that the primary metabolites are N minus one and N minus two. So we're still picking those up with the assay. Um, Min Wook Shin is asking what kinds of methods used for the isolation of uh, ASO from biological samples. Uh, just to clarify, we are talking about sRNAs here, not ASO. But I imagine the question applies. Uh, yeah, so I can speak to both. Um, for us, if you're going to do mass spec, we find that the um, the wax base SBE is the best, and so that's available in a 96 well form. And so you still have to homogenize your samples if you're in tissue, um, and then um, you go and you do the multiple wash steps. It, the washing is pretty similar to how you would extract DNA um, for like a cDNA um, or RNA prep. Um, so it's all in a kit with filters that we purchase. Okay. Um, Satish Jajaf would like to know, um, for the detection of intact antibody sRNA conjugate, what kind of DAR ratio are you detecting? Uh, do you use... Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so we're... Um, we have experience with both DAR1 and DAR2, and so if we're if that question is towards biological samples, you really can't tell the difference in the assay. Um, however, if you're looking to qualify your lots um, or do like analytics on it, um, the TFO ELISA is sensitive to both DAR1 and DAR2, and so you would just um, run. Uh, basically, if you look at the EC50 curves of those, um, we are able to distinguish between those two. And for the data that I showed you, um, we use um, SysMab, um, so they're pretty um, heterogeneous. So there's some... Uh... You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, Pranati? I do apologize if I don't get names quite right. Pranati Mida is asking, which buffer do you use to lyse the samples? And in case of hybridization assay. Yeah, that's an Sorry. Yeah, so with the hybridization assay, we do find buffer sensitivity. Um, so for us, we use basically a TRIS-based salt buffer. Um, it's pretty high salt, um, and there's plate wash steps, so you do wash away some of the buffer. Um, definitely for the nuclease step, we incorporate a um, PBS or phosphate buffer solution because PBS um, quenches the S1 nuclease. So that's a really important step. Once we wash away the nuclease, we come in with a um, a PBS based buffer and it really stops that nuclease um, from over digesting your samples. Okay, are there any more questions? Um, doesn't seem to be. Um, in which case, I uh, thank you very much again, Mai, and um, hopefully, we'll see you okay. next week at OTS. Well, Saturday or Sunday. Yes, I'll be there. Um, and quite a few of the attendants, hopefully, as well. Um, we haven't got a scheduled science webinar, but there is a webinar plan for patient representatives on the 19th of November, and our young representative on the board, our trainee board representatives, um, Jacob and Daniel, will um, head that. So maybe if anyone is interested, you might attend that as well. Thank you very much again, Mai. And uh, thank you very much for everyone for attending. Bye. Bye.